Eric, we just want to uh, continue uh, with our interview, and uh, we have some of your memorabilia here, and I just wonder if you could take us through uh, what the, the, these uh, memorabilia mean to you and uh, their, their significance. Yes, well, they're very significant for me, Peter. First of all, uh, during World War II, of course, there was no interstate, no representative football at all. Uh, the, the, although there was a, a New South Wales team went to Queensland at the end of 1945, officially uh, the representative program started in, back in 1946, the year after the war finished. And uh, this is the New South Wales uh, Rugby Union blazer, which not only myself, but also Ken Carney and Lenny Wolf. We had the Parramatta, the full Parramatta front row, played for the state in Queensland in 1946. And it was the first time that a club front row had ever represented New South Wales. And uh, Carney, of course, is, is well known to everybody, both in league and union. Lenny Wolf was the unfortunate one of the three because Len was equally as good as either of us, but somebody had to miss out apparently, so Len was always on the losing end. And when the team uh, following the New South Wales and Queensland State games, of which Wolf, Carney and Tweedo were the front row, uh, the team to go to New Zealand was picked almost immediately after. and. Uh, I was the only one picked to go to New Zealand that year. Uh, Carney, Carney was in the Air Force actually, and I don't think he, I don't think they would allow him to go. And Lenny, for some reason or other, missed out on that team. It was a shame because he was a wonderful forward. And uh, the same thing happened the following year in 1947, before the team went to England. Um, it was thought that Carney. Tweed Allen Wolf would be the front row to be picked. Once again, Len missed out. It's a great shame. But uh, yes, uh, that is a New South Wales, so too was that one, that's in 1948. This, that's the 1947-48 badge, uh, blazer badge uh, for the Wallabies in 1947-48 to go to Britain, France and America. That one it was the one, the 46 one actually. Rather interesting that when I, in 1949, I was offered a job by the Shell Company which excluded my uh, con continuity in the Wallabies. They said, well, you can have the job or you can, or you can, uh, keep on playing. So I took the job and so I, I dropped out of the international team in 1949 and but I represented from Forbes. Uh, I was captain of the New South Wales country team for the next three years uh, and uh, also uh, as captain of the country I was captain of, against the 1950 British Lions in Canberra, I was the captain of the All Blacks at Parks in 1951 and also captain of the combined country team against Fiji in 1952, the first Fijian team. So did you beat Fiji? The other but, uh, team. I, 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 I didn't ask me the results, <laughs> the score. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> So they, were, they, were, they were close, they okay. the, 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 the country was just recovering a little more slowly than the city in, into rugby union and there wasn't a great deal of, of uh, rugby union played in the country as compared with what it is today. But uh, that, that was, uh, and, and strangely enough I enjoyed those, I enjoyed playing in the country much more than I did in the city because it was played on a much more social basis, yeah. but I'm not telling any stories out of school. 
play that. Nine more stories. Well. Don't ask me any any embarrassing to tell you any embarrassing stories. Eric, we um, just want to go and talk to you about the uh, the New South Wales team in. 1946. 46. Yeah. Just one you could tell us a little bit about the, the, the Parramatta players, the notable players in there. Uh, yes. I, I, is Nick Shahady in this one? Or is yeah, that Nick Shahady's there. There's the Nick Shahady. Young, right young Nick Shahady at 20 years of yes. age, from what we can gather. Yes. Could you just take us through that a little bit? Yes, as I was speaking to you before, the, this photo contains the entire Parramatta front row. But yes, we'll, we'll go back. There's Ken Carney. Then all for myself, but amongst the other reasonably or famous faces, which in uh, later years, there's Charlie East, is probably one of the best wingers that Australia ever produced. Trevor uh, Trevor Allen, equally as good. Yes, Cyril Burke. Yeah, Arthur Buchan, Mick Shahady, Mick Cremen. Wonderful. Cole Wyndham, of course, Joe Crift. Uh, just some of those who went on from that yeah, first New South Wales team to become quite famous on the international. So you <laughs> talked about Len Wolf missing out and things like that. How many first grade games would you have played for Parramatta, would you know? Uh, well, Len came up to us from eastern suburbs. He came up to live at Auburn and he was there for about uh, five years. Okay, so he's yeah. played a considerable number of first grade. Yes, I, I think and Ken he, Carney. Uh, Ken Carney. Well, Ken didn't play a great amount of games because uh, he came back in 1945 from England, where he was serving in the Air Force, and he played in 1946. He played club ga a few club games in 1945. He played the full season in 1946 but still in the RAF in 1947 when he was demobilised uh, he and I were chosen as the only two Parramatta players in the 1947-48 team to go to England. Ron Rankin and I were the two players that played a club game after the team to go to New Zealand was chosen. The, the, the New South Wales or the Australian Rugby Union didn't tell us not to play, they didn't want us, they just said we'd rather you didn't. But uh, the, the season was a very critical for Parramatta and it was important that I played for Parramatta. And Ron Rankin played for Des Moines that day. Uh, <laughs> and Ron Rankin broke his leg. Oh no. Yeah, which, which finished, uh, finished his football career. career. Yes, he never represented again after that. But would have loved to, he, he was our number one fullback, and a very fine fullback too. So did that team have a style? Was it running rugby like Randwick, or was it you know, grind and tough it out? Or no, we were we were running. We we ran the ball wherever we possibly could. Yeah, it uh, of course uh, the what Wally Ma, who was one of the Waratahs, nineteen twenty seven Waratahs instituted or is, is renowned uh, for introducing running rugby to, to Randwick and uh, all other teams more or less tried to say to play the same type of football. So we, we became the Australian team that year and in years to come became noted for their attempt to play running rugby all the time. But we only knew one style of play actually and that was the running game and we, we loved it and everybody else everybody else loved it too because it was an open style of, uh, open style of football. Um, Eric, just going to ask you a few questions about uh, this really important cap. Um, I know your son-in-law Bob um, had it made up for you. Can you just tell us a little bit about the history of the cap and some of the games and things that you were involved in? Yes. This is the official Australian Rugby Union cap presented to all players who represented the country. But it was discontinued back in the 1920s and it wasn't reintroduced until early 2000s when John O'Neill 
decided that everybody who played for Australia must have a cap. And so that system of uh, every of, of presenting all, all Australians with caps was reintroduced in about that, about that time. Um, there's not much else to tell. Uh, every player now that represents Australia is presented with a cap and everybody that represented between 2003 and going back to the 1930s would have got one uh, cap also. So is this a, a, um, as a program for every uh, game you represented well, against Australia or is that... Well, or first that of all, may I say, Peter, that I, I my son-in-law, Bob Smith, uh, asked could he have the cap to show some of his friends at work, uh, which I naturally lent him, and it came back three weeks later in that particular form, this being the cap itself, uh, this uh, is the pro from the programs of each of the test match I played for Australia, and that is the photo of the 1946 All Blacks, the first test match played after World War Two. But uh, I might say that whilst I was representing Australia for four years, I only represented Australia ten times but there were only 12 test matches played during those four years uh, and I missed two through injury. So uh, uh, That's <laughs> pretty people, good. people, people uh, or players today would be play more test matches in half a season well, that would have took me four years to, to deserve. So uh, oh, I was it, it, may, it may seem uh, 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 even just a few test matches to the average player or the average supporter today, but this four, four years of hard work got ready to get him that, uh, that number. One of the uh, strange things about that 47-48 team, we didn't have a goal kicker in the team. There wasn't one recognised goal kicker in the whole 30 players, that was big. Somehow they didn't recognise uh, that they could carry a goal kicker, you know. Uh, but uh, we, of the 98 uh, tries we scored in the UK, we converted, I think, 28 of the 98. Uh, and we, and in the whole 30 games we played, we only kicked 17 penalty goals. And one field goal. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this, this illustrates really that our, our victories were based on running football. In other words, scoring tries. We didn't. We, we never even thought of trying to play the game down the opposite end of the field. You know, in enemy territory. We just got the ball and we tried to institute running rugby all the time. And uh, in doing so, we, we got. Uh, scored 98 tries, but our goal kicking record was uh, invisible. <laughs> really uh, Eric, I just want to uh, tell us a little bit about this photograph here, uh, being your last uh, test for Australia, where you chose uh, your career as opposed to playing rugby as the modern era is. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that was... Uh, the Maori team came out here in 1949, we played them three tests. We lost the first, we drew, drew the second and the, the third test match played on Sydney Cruise and we won that test match 18 points to three. Um, the Maori's are always tough blokes, tough blokes to play with. They, they'd rather have a a fight on the feed, so the, the old saying goes, and uh, they were very hard, but uh, um, it was the most in, uh, off the field, the marriage were the most lovely people you'd wish to meet, and the first ones to put a beer in your hand, but on the field, they were, they were the Bill Cerati type, where they changed personalities as soon as they went on the field, but uh, they had nothing much to report on that one, really, that, that 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 team was a lot of players in there. Oh yes, yes, my there's uh, Captain Trevor Allen, 
Colin Wyndon, Neville Cottrell, Cyril Burke, Brian Piper, Charlie Eastings, Nick Shahady, David Brockoff, yes. David Brockoff, okay. Yeah, David. And uh, yes, they were all important players, yes. But, uh, uh, but some of them probably will be remembered a lot longer, I think. So had you decided at that game this was going to be your last, or did you decide after? Well, uh, I, I was, I, I was uh, given the job before that game, and I decided that that would be my last game immediately after. Following this game, we sent the team over to South Africa. I'm sorry, we sent the team over to New Zealand, and that particular team won the uh, won the Bledisloe Cup. So there was a lot of talent in there. Quite so, how did you feel about that? Did you a bit lousy? <laughs> but uh, but I, I I went to Forbes and uh, you know, I started a, a rugby club at Forbes, which was uh, still continuing to this day. So, mm. I, I, when when uh, my career really was was stopped in when I was twenty years of age, I stopped playing football until the end, and much of that time was spent away from home and then of course in, in, in 1946 just after the war I went away to, to New Zealand in 1947-48 I was away for nine months uh, overseas in, in the UK and France so I think I made the right decision I, I'd spent a hell of a lot of time away from home in that so 10 years were you married I, then? I was married and I had a baby daughter so uh, that was uh, a big commitment then. Oh, yes, yeah, uh, my my one and only child, Kay, my daughter, was born while I was playing in New Zealand in 1946. So you can imagine that I w was feeling a little bit uh, um, very aware of the fact that it was about time I gave the family a bit of a, a bit of a go. <laughs> Which does I mean, she, never does she still raise it today or she's forgiven you for no, not being there? I don't think she ever did but uh, never, I, I don't blame her one little bit because admittedly to, to, to be in those days as an amateur to, to spend so much time playing football and or giving football priority over your family life, it was a bit selfish, and I, I agreed there, and that's why I, I decided I'd, I'd take the job and uh, forsake the football career. I, I, I'm quite sure I could have stayed for three or four more years in representative, uh, but uh, that's the way it goes. Eric, I'm just uh, having a look at this. Uh, uh, certificate I guess or mm. sports presented for the sports medal from the Queen Elizabeth and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what it means to you and how you came to buy it. Yes well I think the wedding uh, speaks for itself because this was a, a, a medal instituted by the Queen uh, to probably commemorate the year 2000 but it was given to uh, athletes and sportsmen of all sports, both female, male and female, uh, for people who uh, had had a distinguished career in their particular sport. And I was fortunately uh, one of the recipients. Yes. Eric, I, I, I guess the uh, war um, curtailed a lot of people's sporting careers. I know yourself, you'd, you'd represented before you went to the war. And then you join the navy, and that. I just wonder if you can tell us a little bit about um, the impact the war had on you, and things like that, and how it changed uh, you, I guess, as a person too. And and uh, then coming back to represent Australia again in in forty seven. And then yes, yes, Peter. The, the, the war certainly upset the sporting careers of a lot of people. My own included, because I, I was just coming in to the, the, the representative side in 1940 uh, and then I, I 
was a wife all that time during the war. Not away from, from not away out of Australia all the time by any means, but uh, there was no representative games played during the war and I had to pick it up. So I lost six years and the, probably the prime six years of my life because when I came back uh, I was no longer the, the youngest kid in the team. I was a, I was a 25 years old and by that time you're regarded as a veteran. So um, I've uh, I, I, I haven't forgiven the Hitler for, for, for spoiling my sporting career. <laughs> it took six years of it anyway. Eric, the last one that we have here, and I know it's important to you, is um, being a life member of uh, Parramatta Rugby. And just to sort of encapsulate on that, I know that uh, over many years as a player and an official, I guess having talked to you before was that you, one of your greatest satisfactions was uh, forming the uh, the Parramatta Juniors and then and seeing those juniors come all the way through to eventually ensuring that we won the 77, 85 and uh, 86 grand final. So as a life member, what can you just tell us a little thing about your well, career and how this is achieved and what year you got uh, your life membership and and the importance of Parramatta to you? Well, first of all, to go right back to the start, I started playing in Par with Parramatta at the age of 15 back in 1937. And I finished playing at Parramatta, playing as ca their captain coach in 1958. So there's 21 years in between, during which, uh, of course, I was away in the, in the Navy part of it and playing representative football. but. Um, I value that very much indeed because although I only played 120 first grade games, it was spread over a vast number of years. That's pretty good, I haven't it? Uh, but I, I've, I, as well as a player, I've, I've captain coached the first grade team on t for two or three years of that. Uh, uh, I was president of the club for two years in the early 60s. Uh, probably I, I put more work into the juniors than the seniors, but uh, with with very, very good results. So what year were you awarded this one, the life membership, can you remember? Uh, it'll be back, back in the 1970s. So I know it was, I was nominated by players who had come up through the juniors. It was rather funny. The, how, how good the, kid, the, the, the kids that I that I I'd coached up from being only small tots, uh, they were the ones that uh, that uh, nominated me for. Yeah. Right. Well, Eric, I uh, would like to congratulate you on a wonderful life and a wonderful career and, and uh, you're an amazing person and uh, a true gentleman and I'd just like to thank you for allowing us to, to talk to you like this candidly because I believe that we're custodians of lo not local history but to know about Parramatta and your journey with Parramatta and uh, hopefully mm. the, jo the journey will continue and strengthen and I thank you for that and your contribution to Australia, New South Wales, Parramatta and no, your Peter. contribution now as a patron. Oh, yes, that's right, yeah. Well, I'm very proud of that too. But I could tell you a lot of stories and I could make them up because there's nobody here to, to contradict them. I'm about the only one left of that particular era, era going back to the 1930s. I don't know why the, why the good Lord chose me to remain here, probably reckons I've, uh, well, it's taken me a long while to deserve my place up there, <laughs> still waiting. Yes.